Guys, I'm so happy to be here. My first job was at the Ruth's Chris Steakhouse in the Terrytown Marriott in Westchester, New York. Um, there I had a split role as a busboy and a host. I, I'd been working in restaurants for a long time, but not really. My dad was in the restaurant business, and so for years before that, I'd always go to work with him. But this felt different. It felt like up until that point, I'd always been playing restaurant, and now I got to actually go work in one. Um, I loved it from day one. I learned a lot there. Um, I never knew who owned that restaurant, but I was always inspired by the way that they approached it. Ruth Chris is a chain, right? You don't get to pick your menu as an owner. But he somehow figured out how to imbue creativity into it. Um, there was this calamari dish there. It was just like normal fried calamari with an aioli, except rather than rings, there were little strips. Here's the thing, though. You couldn't order the calamari. Obviously, he wasn't allowed to change the menu. It was just there as an SFN, a little something extra for either regulars of the restaurant or VIPs or people that he wanted to feel like VIPs. Um, I was always inspired by that and continue using that to this day because a lot of restaurants you go to and they want to make you feel special, they send you an extra dessert or a glass of champagne. You can look at the menu and figure out how many dollars worth of love they want to give you. Here, because you couldn't order the calamari, it was by definition priceless. I've always tried to come up with moments like that in my restaurants ever since. Um, but the biggest thing I learned from that restaurant, and honestly the reason why I remember that calamari was a lesson that I got from my dad. Because when I got that job, he gave me my first journal. Um, I use the word intention a lot. I think it's a very, very important thing to have and to be both in how you lead and how you serve, to be intentional, and that was something I got from him. And so he gave me a journal and made me, remember, I was young, my dad could still make me do stuff, write in my journal every single night when I got home from work. The reason for that, he said, was that perspective has an expiration date. He had more faith in my career at that time than I did, and he was confident if that I decided to really do it, that I was gonna go off and do great things, and, that I get promoted and promoted and promoted. And anyone here who's been promoted, you know that one of your superpowers when you get promoted is having unbelievable empathy for the position you were just in. But after a couple months, no matter how hard you try to hold on to that perspective, it's fleeting and it goes away. He wanted me to journal such that I could capture my perspectives over the course of my career and in doing so, hold on to them and become the most empathetic leader that I could possibly be. I hated journaling in the beginning, but like most things, once I did it enough and it became a practice, I grew to love it. I journaled as a busboy at Spago in Beverly Hills. I journaled as a server at Tribeca Grill. I journaled when working the front door at Tabla in New York, and then as a controller, and then as the GM at the restaurants at MoMA, and then I journaled when I ultimately took my role at 11 Madison Park. The journaling always helped me maintain a perspective, but it also started to do other things for me as well. I would journal every time I'd go out to a competitor's restaurant. I would journal about the things that they did really well that I wanted to steal and make our own. I'd journal about the things that they didn't do well that I thought we could do better and perhaps in doing so make us best in class at. I would journal every single night at the end of service over a glass of wine much like an athlete goes to the tapes to see what we did wrong so that we could fix it and to see what we did well so that we could continue doing that thing and put systems behind it. I journal after service when I remembered all the people that I spoke to in a way that I wasn't proud of such that I could go to work the next day and apologize to those people. Not for the message I delivered, but for the way in which I delivered it. I don't think there are many things more powerful than a leader being willing to criticize themselves through apologizing when they've done something wrong. Journaling has been a really instrumental part of my career. I think if you can build a practice of reflection, if you can set yourself up for success in allotting time to reflect on the day that came before, see what you can learn from it, how you can allow it to make you grow and to capture your perspective along the way, it's transformative. And also, if you happen to write a book, having a career's worth of journaling makes it a whole lot easier to remember what you've actually done in your life. We started the Welcome Conference in 2014. We did it because I'd been going around the world and speaking at cooking chef conferences. 
that every time I did, I found that I was one of the only dining room people there. And these conferences were so important for the world of cooking. It was in those rooms that people who cooked for a living came together and shared ideas and connected to form community and inspired one another. And I believe because of those conferences, the craft of cooking globally became better. And yet, there was nothing for hospitality. But I believe, like I know so many of you do, that Hospitality is a craft as well. It's a muscle that we can collectively strengthen. But if we don't have rooms where we can get together with like-minded people and celebrate the thing that we are so passionate about, we're holding ourselves back. The first welcome conference was in 2014 in this little auditorium in the East Village. And over the years, it got bigger and bigger and bigger. Now at Lincoln Center in New York City and also coming back for the second year at what has very quickly become one of my favorite food cities in the world, Chicago. It said pander to the audience here, I just wanted to. Um, <laughs> Every one of you got one of these, right? So, okay, at face value, this is just a piece of branded swag. It costs like 20 bucks or something, but what you choose to do with it today is what will determine its ultimate value. Because here's the thing about this conference, or at least it's been this for me every year since we started hosting it, is it will fill your gas tank, undeniably. You'll share ideas, you're gonna connect with other people that do what you do and love what they do as much as you do what you do. You're gonna leave fired up. But if you're not careful, you're going to go home, and life and work are going to be busy, and you're going to just kind of get swept right back into things, and everything that you wanted to take away from this conference will be lost. So I'm asking you to journal. Over the course of the day, when you hear something that moves you, whether it's an idea that's groundbreaking and can change your worldview, or whether it's just something that helps you more perfectly articulate an idea that you understand intuitively, write it down. And then use what you've written down as a reference point over the course of the year to come. Use it as a measuring stick. Use it as a way to hold yourself accountable to maintain the promises you made for yourself today, the ways in which you want to grow, the things you want to be better at, the leader, the server, whatever it is that you want to grow in doing. Um, I promise if you do that, this day will be much more meaningful than if you don't. I believe there's beauty in looking back before you look forward. And I also believe it's good to show that I'm not just talking, I actually do this. And so what I wanna to do today is share some of the things in the last nine years of welcome that I've been most influenced by, that I've been most inspired by, in hopes that we can just kick things off, a little cliff's notes of sorts for the last nine years. One of the things I always tell people every time they're doing a welcome conference speech, and this is a rule of public speaking that I learned a long time ago, is deliver one salient point. Tell them what you're gonna tell them, then tell them what you told them, and then tell you what, tell them what you're gonna tell them, then tell them, and tell them what you told them. The best speeches are those where you walk away with one idea. That's not what this is, this is a mixtape. So just bear with me. So here we go. I'm gonna read you some of these things that really inspired me in hopes that we can kind of summarize a bunch of years and pass on that inspiration to you. Because the other thing, journaling not only makes you better, but it allows you to become a better teacher in passing some of these ideas forward, which is the whole point of today. Okay. Bobby Stuckey. Okay, I often think about service versus hospitality. Service doesn't demand that you care and hospitality is necessary that you care. You can't fake it. Bobby Stuckey, restaurateur from Frasca, one of the greats. I remember when he said this, it was so important to me because I believe that any organization that hasn't figured out the difference between service and hospitality is holding itself back. I used to ask the same question to everyone I interviewed, what's the difference between service and hospitality? One of the best answers I ever got came from a woman I ended up not hiring. She said, service is black and white, hospitality is color. Service is the technical thing we do in our world. It's getting the right plate to the right person at the right time. Hospitality is how you make people feel when you do that thing. Service is a part of the product. Hospitality is the way we serve that product. 
I remember when he said it, it helped confirm the thing that I believed and made me want to be just as unreasonable in pursuit of how we made people feel as we were in perfecting the product itself. I love that one. Okay, the next one, Gabrielle Hamilton, the chef at Prune. You can actually teach people to be nice. <laughs> when I was coming up in my career, I remember some of the people that I actually held as my greatest mentors would always say, you hire for hospitality and you train excellence. I'm sure many of you have heard that before. And I always didn't feel that was right. And then hearing it from a chef of this cool little restaurant in the East Village actually validated that for me. Here's the thing, if we only hire people who are already nice, who are already embodying hospitality, A, we're holding ourselves back in the people that we can surround ourselves with, and B, we're selling ourselves short in our leadership. I believe everyone has kindness in them. I believe everyone has the capacity to be hospitable. But until you know how good it feels to receive hospitality, it's impossible to be fired up and passionate about wanting to give it. Perhaps most importantly, until you can put someone in the position where they're able actually able to extend hospitality to someone else, they are not able to get addicted to this beautiful thing that we love. But I believe that, and I felt validated when I heard it. I do believe you can teach people to be nice, and I hope we all hold that with us. This next one, when I talk about hearing something that changes your worldview, from Danny Meyer, the best way to use a policy is to think of it as a guideline and to use it as an opportunity to break that policy in the name of hospitality. Here's the thing about rules and policies. They're really important, right? In the absence of rules and policies, we have an inability to be consistent, to actually maintain a set of standards, but in most companies, and this was most certainly true of mine when I heard him say those words, we add and add and add. There's more and more and more rules. They're always added, they're never taken away. And here's the thing about rules. They stand in the way of collaboration, they stand in the way of empowerment, and they stand in the way of hospitality. When I first heard that line, I went back and implemented a new system with my company where every year we had a rules audit, where it wasn't that we had to decide that a rule no longer deserved to exist, but we went through all of our policies and had to prove, again, that they needed to exist, that they deserved to exist. And obviously, we had a lot less when we did that. And obviously, our hospitality became so much better. Sarah Robbins, the hotelier from 21C, if you are never prepared to be wrong, you are never going to do anything original. I heard a similar line from Alain Ducasse at MAD years ago, where he said, if we never close a restaurant, it means we're failing. It means we didn't push hard enough. Um, if you're never wrong, it means you never walked close enough to the edge. And one of the things that that gave me the grace to do was to fuck up every once in a while. And I hope we all feel that grace, because the only way you can ever change the game is by being willing to fail and getting so close to the edge that every once in a while you're gonna fall off. And that's okay, that's when true innovation happens in our ability to lead and in the products we serve. Thomas Cox, this is one of my favorites. Thomas Cox was the general manager at Claridge's, one of my favorite hotels in the world. We want to become a part of the story of people's lives. Important enough in those individual experiences that if those people wrote an autobiography, we would be featured a little bit in it. My dad gave me this paperweight when I was a kid. It said, what would you attempt to do if you knew you could not fail? He would always challenge me to answer that question honestly, and whatever the answer was, to try to do that. He'd always go on to say that far too many people are scared to say their most audacious goals out loud for fear that if they do and don't achieve them, they'll let themselves and everyone around them down. But he'd also say that if you don't have the confidence and conviction to dream big out loud, it's unlikely your biggest dreams will ever come true. I knew that for years leading up to the moment Thomas said those words that I just read to you, but I'd always applied them to accolades. I want to have four stars. I want to have three stars. I want to become the number one restaurant in the world. I'd never applied it to the extent to which I could impact people's lives. To be a part of someone's autobiography. You talk about audacity. 
And I approached our work with that level of audacity from that point forward, and I don't know if we succeeded or not, but man, we got a whole lot further down the road than had we not even tried. Brian Canlis, sitting right here. Hi, Brian. If we can have the courage to not act out of self-preservation, but to actually turn towards them, you can call someone to greatness. If you are lucky enough to be surrounded by people at your work that are like-minded, that want, like you do, to be the best they can possibly be at their work, here's a promise I can make you. There will be tension. It's undeniable. Because if you're lucky enough to work alongside people who all want to achieve the same goal, it's invariable that you're all going to disagree on the right way to achieve it. And when you have passionate people disagreeing, there's tension. But here's the thing. A part of our human condition is to lean back in moments of tension because it's uncomfortable, when in reality, we should be celebrating those moments, celebrating what the presence of those moments mean, and acknowledging that if we lean into those moments, we can not only understand the other person more effectively, but by processing through them, we can come up with the greatest possible next step for our organization. Turn towards tension. I'd never heard it articulated like that, and I loved it. Simon Sinek, there is no such thing as winning. There's only ahead, and there's only behind, and in the infinite game, the only competitor is yourself. I needed that when I heard it, because I had, for way too long, leading up to that day, been focused on winning. And what that reminded me of is that what we do, it's not for the accolades, it's not to get the right review, what success should look like if we have the wherewithal to define it accordingly is just being the most fully realized version of ourselves every day when we walk through those doors. It's making ourselves happy, which for me comes with making other people happy, regardless how many stars you get or how good the last review was. And then the last one, Dr. Wendy Mogul, a, shy, a child psychologist, which for so many reasons, having a child psychologist talk to our industry felt really appropriate. <laughs> All of you in the hospitality industry are parents to the public. And what I say to the parents is do to yourself, is, yes, do to yourself what you want your children to do to others. I believe our work is important. We would talk about this all the time in our restaurants because if you don't have the ability to name for yourself why the work matters, why you can really genuinely materially impact other people, and if you don't make sure that everyone on your team understands its importance as well, none of you will have the ability to be your best selves on the worst days. But I believe, yeah, we're not saving lives, but we're impacting them. We get to help people celebrate some of the most important moments of their lives. Conversely, we give them the grace, if only for a few hours, to forget about their most difficult moments. We can inspire people to be better versions of themselves simply through our attention to detail. And if I'm getting super soapboxy, and I believe this, we can make the world a nicer place just by being really nice to everyone that walks through our doors. All of us in this room, thank you. All of us in this room have an awesome power. We have an amazing opportunity, perhaps even a responsibility, to create these little magical worlds in a world that needs more magic. And so I'm so excited for all of us to be here together to amplify our collective voices, to learn from some pretty remarkable people such that when we leave here today, journals filled with notes in hand, we can all go out there and start making some magic. Welcome back to Welcome Chicago.